press the button, go live on YouTube. I think we're gonna see ourselves in a second. Hey, it is Open Tech Will Save Us number 12. We have a selection. We have three really cool presentations tonight. Uh, first up, we have a group. Um, this is Kim Allen from Primal Glow, joined by her colleagues uh, Sharon Kennedy uh, from Nomadic Labs, Brent Edwards, and they are going to talk about a actually super cool project um, called the Safe Support Chat Project. Um, this is something which uses Matrix, but I mean, I'll let those guys uh, introduce it themselves. We also have Will Bamberg, who, if you're a, a loyal viewer of the Matrix uh, YouTube channel, you'll have seen him um, talking to us on Matrix Live recently. He also completed a great project for us, um, which is spec.matrix.org, and he'll mention that, I expect. And then finally, Bruno, uh, our very own element um, hydrogen client creator, um, is going to talk about the latest news about hydrogen. Um, and yeah, I'm actually quite excited by this because I feel like I've got, a, got myself out of the loop um, with this one too, <laughs> even though I could ask him anytime what's going on. With it. Uh, I never managed to do that. So, hey, uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves and we'll start with the, um, the safe support folk. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, first of all, we want to say thank you so much to Matrix uh, and Ben for inviting us uh, today to talk about this uh, project that we have been working on, uh, Safe Support Chat. Uh, we are so proud of it and we're so happy to be here to, to chat about it. Um, so uh, first thing I want to uh, mention is uh, Safe Support Chat is a, a tool that has been created for the Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers, which is a coalition of sexual assault centers, there's 30 of members, in the province of Ontario, Canada. And so uh, we wanted to, uh, to mention that and talk, I'm gonna just do a little bit, uh, con contextualize uh, how this chat uh, service was built. So uh, my company, uh, Primal Gold Communications, um, um, we've been, I've been working with the Ontario Coalition for uh, actually now uh, four years on a project. And so I am leading um, the project with the Safe Support Chat. And we're gonna introduce ourselves and then I'll come back and talk a little bit about why we, uh, we landed on Matrix. So, so I'm, Brent. I'm, I'm Brent Edwards. Um, I've been taking kind of the uh, sysadmin DevOps role um, on this project. I came to this project um, in 2019 in October. Uh, I met Kim at a hackathon where uh, we started working on this. Great. And Sharon. Oh, we did we lose Sharon? Sorry, I'm still here. I was just oh. unmuting myself. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Sharon. Uh, so I am uh, one half of Nomadic Labs. We are a small digital product studio and I'm a software developer. And I came to this project through uh, a, meet a meetup called Civic Tech Toronto. And I've been working on it for the past year and a half. Uh, so I do more of the product development, basically coding the, the front end. Great. So. Um, Promical Communications has been partnering with the Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers now since 2016. And the uh, original goal for the project was to uh, create uh, uh, digital capacity for sexual assault centers in frontline settings, and also to find some innovative uh, new approaches to using technology to support survivors in sexual, uh, the survivors of sexual violence. We received some funding from the provincial government to do that work. And uh, so that's when the project be began. Uh, we did a lot of consultations, uh, which is the nature of a uh, not-for-profit. And uh, we talked to all of the sexual assault centers across the province. I visited all of them and talked to over 150 frontline uh, setting staff work, uh, workers or support workers. Uh, we did environmental scan. We did. Uh, we researched all different digital uh, tools that were uh, basically built at that point. Uh, we talked to different uh, organizations that were using different tools, and then we started to. We decided on digital tools that we were going to use, off the shelf tools. Never had any intention of actually building something because that was not uh, part of the uh, funding uh, that we received. 
And so then we trained the staff on how to use those tools. And then we started piloting some of those digital tools in frontline settings. And we learned a lot about crisis support uh, using those tools. We used um, video tools, uh, video counseling support tools, uh, crisis online chat, texting. Uh, we used a lot of different things to, to to find out what would work best for these sexual assault centers in the work they did. Of course, when we were finding this, uh, using these tools, none of these tools were used or were built uh, specifically for the kind of uh, support work that the sexual assault centers do. Um, so we were we weren't happy with those those tools. So we approached the uh, funder, and and proposed that we should look at maybe building something for them. And we were very surprised they came back and said, yes, we had been uh, doing this uh, project for three years. We had a lot of user uh, research information and we knew uh, a lot about the, the technology tools that we had been trying to use. So they said, yes. We then uh, spent some time uh, exploring what was out there, what we could uh, do to build. And this was a very sharp learning uh, curve um, as someone who has is not in the tech sector. Um, so we took some time and had conversations and we went to Civic Tech Toronto, did a pitch and had a conversation with over 20 people uh, who gave us some guidance and advice. We just we had conversations. We chatted with folks in the tech sector who were very generous with their advice um, and who led us to other uh, people within the tech sector to talk to us about what we were looking to do, which led us to Matrix. I was uh, exploring different APIs. Um, and at the time, I had no idea even what an API was. I was learning a lot as I, as I went along. And just in a conversation I had with someone, they were um, searching. Uh, for APIs and they came across Matrix. They didn't know anything about it and they said, you should check this out. This looks like a really kind of cool thing to, to use. So that is how we came across Matrix. It was not a short and uh, direct path. We did a lot of uh, work on di with using different tools and a lot of conversations, but we are so happy we found Matrix. So at that point, after Civic Tech uh, Toronto, it was suggested we approach Ottawa Random Hacks of Kindness and uh, get on to their weekend to do a hackathon. Uh, we, uh, they were willing to set up a matrix playground for the weekend. And we then had um, uh, uh, Civic Tech uh, folks volunteer for 48 hours to see whether matrix was the tool that we should be uh, looking at using. Um, and then actually started exploring some of the things that we could use it for. So it was a fantastic weekend. Um, and then from there, we uh, moved into uh, looking at using it and, and brought together the project team that includes Sharon and Brent. So we did. We knew a lot about the needs of our support seekers and we have two end users. We've got the support seekers and we've got the sexual assault center uh, support workers. We knew a lot from what we had, we had done um, in the work uh, in the two and a half years, three years before we, we discovered uh, uh, Matrix. We knew that people wanted to connect with sexual assault centers uh, using uh, digital, whether it was texting or online chat. Uh, we knew that they wanted to stay uh, uh, anonymous or not known. Uh, we knew this from um, uh, the other work that sexual assault centers do as well. And we also knew that they wanted something that was comfortable and familiar. As you can imagine, disclosing that kind of information um, to a, a stranger, uh, then not knowing who that person was um, could be quite daunting. So we knew that about the support seeker. So in terms of the uh, sexual assault centers, their needs were different um, as, as you can imagine. So we wanted to, uh, they wanted to ensure that there was nothing being tracked um, about that person who was su seeking support. Uh, they didn't have to log in. They didn't have to share any information about who they were. They needed to be able to manage their software and their own data. So these centers who are part of this coalition are uh, all autonomous. They don't actually have a ruling body uh, within that uh, organization. They all get different funding. They have different governance structures. They have different programming. So they have uh, really different uh, uh, ways that they do the work that they do. So they needed to be able to do it the way that they needed to do it as individual centers. And they needed to know that the communication that they were having with support seekers was protected. Uh, that was 
very important for the sexual assault centers. So knowing this, we came up and identified the key features. And this is all the amazing work that was ha happening at the Random Hacks of Kindness event in Ottawa. Uh, we had front end and back end developers. We had designers. We had um, researchers. We had a lot of people at that table. And we were able to identify some of the key features there. We wanted it as an anonymous chat service that was available through um, SMS and web. We uh, wanted something like a platform, like Element, for the sexual assault centers that they could log into um, and, and manage their support services. We needed definitely needed end-to-end -end encryption. We needed to have no data collected if uh, they required that and no tracking. And they also wanted to have the services um, individual on each of their own servers, which actually was a bit of a challenge for our our folks at the the hackathon because they're like that's not very efficient, but it wasn't the it wasn't um, to be efficient, but it was about them being able to have control over their own data and services on their own server. So, this is Safe Support Chat. Um, which has been, again, created uh, using uh, Matrix and a customized version of Element. And this is our landing page uh, for the service. So you uh, come into, uh, we have an example of, uh, or we have a setup of the chat on our actual service. So now I'm going to hand it over to Sharon, who's going to talk about how they uh, did the work they did um, on their end. Thank you, Kim. Uh, yeah, okay, so that really covers sort of all of the research and thinking that went into, you know, what is this product and, and service. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about how we actually went about developing all of those features. Um, so we've got a couple different components. There's the chat box, which is sort of like our mini matrix client that gets embedded on the support center's website. Uh, and then we also have a bot that kind of works in the background handling the uh, room invitations and notifications and that kind of thing. And then we also developed an SMS bridge so that people can connect to the service through SMS. Uh, and then we have a very minimally, minimally customized Element web app. Like it's basically just Element, but you know, with a few little tweaks. Uh, and, and then we also have an admin page, which is you know, completely separate from matrix and element, but it allows the support centers to customize their own, uh, their own installation. So the embedded chat box is built with React and um, the matrix JS SDK. And so basically this is what shows up on the center's websites and essentially it's just creating an anonymous account. So we randomly generate a username and password uh, and then oh, creates a new room and invites the bot. And then the bot kind of like takes it from there and invites the facilitator, uh, sorry, the support worker into the room. Um, and then the user can of course just close the chat widget, widget at any time. And that will you know, leave the room, deactivate their account and basically signal to the bot and the facilitators that the, that the support seeker has left. And then we have our lovely chat bot who, um, Basically, like it, so it's built with Node and also the JavaScript SDK. And the bot account is just sitting in there. In we have a room for the support workers and the bot. And the bot is what is kind of like listening for new chat requests from support seekers and then inviting support workers to join that chat. And basically, like as soon as one facilitator joins, then it'll revoke all of the other invitations. So there's only ever it's all, it's always a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, and then when the chat ends, it notifies the rest of the group. And then, you know, when the support seeker and the support worker have both left, it also will, you know, delete the room. So, yeah, the bot is pretty basic in terms of it's just handling notifications and invitations, but it does have a few custom commands that we've implemented, such as um, requesting it. So this, the support worker can request a transcript of the chat and then the bot will generate a transcript of the chat and then it can also delete the transcript. So we also have saying cute bot things and fun things like that. But I think that there is a lot of potential to kind of like increase the commands that the bot uh, could handle. So 
that is some fun opportunities for the future. And then we have the SMS bridge. So this is uh, just one more client that's using Twilio to kind of um, just relay messages back and forth from the support seeker who's connecting over SMS and then you know, creating a matrix account for them and connecting them to the chat room um, where the support workers can then interact with them through the, their element installation. Um, but then the support seeker is still getting all the messages through SMS. So I'll hand it over to Brent to talk about deployment. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so yeah, sorry. Get my mic sorted out. Um, yeah, so like, um, as Kim mentioned before, uh, one of the most important features is that each center has their own uh, instance, right? Um, so for that, reason they all have their own uh synapse the modified version of element that sharon spoke of and then those also those safe support chat uh components the bot and the bridge uh we wanted something that was repeatable um it wouldn't take a ton of time to set up every time so we used um a slightly modified version of the uh ansible deployment um we did make some small modifications to it though which i'll go over on the next uh, slide uh, first thing I'm going to mention, it's not really a customization, but just rather setting that I thought was important enough to mention. Um, federations disabled just to maintain that autonomy uh, for the centers. Um, and from there, so we containerized our, our help bot, the SMS bridge, and uh, created and added roles to the playbook that would deploy them. Uh, these changes included things like uh, encrypting credentials and storing them securely. Um, making necessary changes to like the Nginx proxy. Um, and then the last kind of modification we made was a, a first time application setup, which uh, let's explain in more detail on the next slide. Um, and for, so yeah, so for the first time setup, or sorry, for safe support chat to function correctly, it does require a bit of a specific room setup uh, within the matrix instance. Like you need that, that room with the, uh, support workers uh, that the bot is also in, because it's going to use that to see if any support workers are online when a chat comes in. So instead of relying on the centers to uh, create this, or without having to create a user uh, that I can get into their centers, or we can get into their centers, which we absolutely did not want, um, we just created through a series of, uh, create the setup through a series of API calls. So it's all set up ready uh, as soon as, uh, we give them the, the email saying they're set up. Um, so yeah, so it creates the private room, creates the, the help bot user and the uh, admin user, invites them both into that room, accepts those invitations, and then they're there. It then takes that um, room ID uh, for that room that was created, feeds it into the script that deploys the bot. So then the bot's all set up there um, and has its room ID that it needs. So with this setup, all the center needs to do is take uh, is put that chatbot script up on their website with just a parameter pointing to their uh, matrix server URL, and then they're uh, ready to go live. Um, and then, of course, after as we're rolling it out, as we're uh, getting it out to more and more centers, uh, we're finding opportunities to improve and opportunities to to make life easier for the centers. Um, and this is my favorite example to use of, of something we, we sort of found. So I think like the, the help bot itself is absolutely critical um, for this app to work. If the help bot is, is gone, then uh, no one's going to get invitations. Um, people will just open up the chat box and it'll, it'll sit waiting for facilitators who are never going to get invited. Um, so yeah, after we had rolled rolled it out, we had gotten some uh, some centers had come to us saying that they're not getting chat invitations. They're opening up like the chat box themselves while they're online, trying to to initiate a chat, and they're getting nothing. So we dug into it a bit and saw that those users had ignored the help bot. Um, and of course, the help bot you need the help bot to be able to send you messages. It'll be trying to invite them, but they'll never see it. So in the meantime, we told users, you know, go into your ignored users list. 
remove the help bot from that list and uh, and you're good. But so when we talk about the minimal updates we've made to Element, one of them was just that the invitation would pop up with the three options, accept, reject, and also ignore this user. And uh, we found that support workers uh, were accidentally clicking that one uh, fairly often. So one of those small modifications we made was to remove that, uh, that option from there. Um, and of course, as we move forward, we're looking for more and more opportunities to, to improve and make things better for both the support seekers and the support workers. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back uh, to Kim for a demo. Yay. Great. I, I, I just All have right, to laugh. Demo. I love that uh, Brent is calling those moments opportunities. It didn't feel necessarily like an opportunity when those uh, those challenges came up, but I love your attitude there, Brent. <laughs> okay, excellent. So we're going to show you a live demo of our um, chat uh, chat box. So as uh, Brent mentioned, each of the, or, or Sharon, um, mentioned that the uh, chat uh, box is actually uh, placed onto the uh, individual sexual assault centers uh, website so people can access their support uh, in, in that way and they can also control the scheduling of it as well so they can turn it on it disappears they can customize it we have a great admin page to do all that work and they can customize a lot of the uh, the messaging that goes to them as well so somebody would sit uh, click on the uh, chat start a new chat um, and there's uh, terms and conditions that each of the centers have created and set up on their websites. And once the person says yes, they are told that there's somebody coming. So we wanted to make it very interactive and somebody would know that, that the system is, is working and that somebody would be uh, coming to, uh, to talk to them. You can see that uh, if we're using Element, uh, the platform, and whether it's an SMS message or if it's a chat message, it looks obviously the same way for the support worker. Um, you can see that we've set up the actual chat box so it's very um, user friendly and it looks very familiar to other messaging um, services that are out there. Uh, we, we have the uh, support worker actually seeing all of the activity that's going on within the actual uh, uh, element, as you can see there, as you, as you know, with element, which has actually been very useful to us um, in our pilots when we were trying other chat services, when we were having issues, there was no way that we, we would ever know when I was trying to explain to the other chat services, the tech folks, what was going on. We here actually have some information now that's been, been very useful to us in terms of knowing what, what the issues are uh, when we're, we're uh, providing support. There we have the uh, opportunities to do emojis. We, on top of this, uh, uh, building the tools, we've been training them on how to use the tools, but we also do trainings on how to support somebody on digital platforms, the dynamics, which are very different from face-to-face uh, -face and, and telephone. So we do uh, trainings on you know, how to use emojis and acronyms and um, com use, uh, talking to somebody around complex emotions. So these are things that are going on uh, simultaneously while this uh, these uh, tools are being rolled out to the sexual assault centers. Um, you can see that they are, they're coming in as anonymous um, to the chat service. That is uh, one of the features that is very important for us to have um, as well for for the sexual assault centers. And it's as you can see, it's very uh, real time, which you know. And we can also see when somebody has left the room um, uh, with the uh, chat box uh, Sharon was showing. You can minimize or you can, uh, if, if you need to just minimize the chat and it's still there, or you can close it and it closes right down and the history is gone on that side. Um, and then on our side, the um, senders can keep the transcripts or they can have uh, everything removed. So um, we have a chat coordinator who has more power, can uh, change things within uh, the element program. Um, and yeah, great. Anything else, Sharon, that I should be adding while you're? Um, I think that's it. I see there's other chats coming in, which I have to assume are from people who are <laughs> watching this. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not answering your chats right now. <laughs> So you're getting live support. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm ignoring you. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, that's great. 
Um, yeah, so it's great. It's, what, what's really good is this, also there's a min page that um, uh, Sharon has developed for us that allows the centers to customize both the chat box, the SMS texting, the uh, parts of the element platform, um, schedule, creating schedules. So what's next for us? Uh, we have uh, been, we have found out that the um, Ontario government, um, Ministry of Community and Social Services, uh, Office of Women's Issues is uh, offering us another year of funding. Woohoo! This is awesome. And so we're going to be uh, building, uh, looking at video chat, uh, building the WhatsApp bridge, and uh, with an anonymous connection. We are going to be continuing, obviously, maintenance and improvements. And we're also looking at project sustainability, which is the work that I get to do with the coalition and the sexual assault centers. And how do we make this uh, keep rolling for them? Uh, which is also very exciting. Okay, we are over time. <laughs> uh, that's uh, no problem at all. Thank you oh. for the presentation. So we just have to say one thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you to these uh, Matrix and Element. You guys do the heavy lifting on this. We love it. Uh, one side story, the whole thing that happened with Google, we were on the uh, watching that um, happen with the Google app. And you guys had that fixed and flying and done in 24 hours. We building something like the, uh, this and, and Google doing something like that, we would never have that kind of, of uh, <laughs> impact. So we appreciate that. That, that was a really amazing moment uh, for me to understanding how important we have something like Matrix and Element um, as, as something that we've built on. We've also had many hours of uh, volunteer contribution to this project at this point. Uh, Civic Tech Toronto has been very supportive, Random Hacks of Kindness. We had uh, servers donated for six months. Amazing, amazing, and of course the funding. So thank you. Well done, that's, that's really fantastic. Um, we have, have a couple of questions. Actually, we have quite a few questions. Um, so I'm gonna try and get a mix here of uh, this kind of social and tech questions all mixed up together. So I'll try and pitch them, pitch them at you three and see how we get on. Um, one of the things is that you're obviously quite confident about kind of getting this out to other, other centers. Um, and what does your outreach program for that look like? Is the thing? It, it has been amazing that I've had four years to work with this group. And I actually have to admit, I come from that sector that, that, and so there was a lot of trust in terms of the, uh, with me starting this project with them. And they've been right from the very beginning with us. So right now we have uh, 13 centers rolling. Uh, we have 18 centers and in all uh, interested out of that 30. Um, and we have, uh, I've, I have another presentation this week and we'll have another, I don't know how many. The issue is not so much about them trusting using this service, but they understand that this is a tool. We're going to give them this tool, but then they have to build a service uh, on top of that. So there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of work that they do on their end to make it work. But they have been right at, like day one with us on this. So they trust and believe in this. Um, they just, their capacity, um, they're a yeah. scrappy bunch of, women who make get things done, but it is uh, an, an extra programming. All right, we'll make sure that there's contact info in the in the, in the the description here, just because I think there's people who are gonna wanna contact you. Um, so in terms of the service, um, somebody's asking, oh, this is Thibaut. Uh, are, are, support, are the people aware of the digital threats that they face? Um, is that why you're interested in end-to-end in -end encryption and this kind of security? Um, and also, relatedly, how do you cope with, for example, um, no technology can stop somebody just reading over your shoulder or looking at your, you know, unlocking your phone by some other mechanism? Um, so what are your thoughts around, around that, I guess? Yeah, I'll start on this one. This one's really important for us because we know that um, support seekers need to be safe when they're accessing these services. And so it's not only that we are providing this um, moment, we're also educating them and, and making them aware of, of their what's going on on their end. Like we know with SMS texting, we cannot protect, you know, who they need to um, delete their history to, to say safe. So these, uh, the sexual assault centers are really aware of all that they've been working with their, obviously their support seekers for a very long time on how to, to, stay, to stay safe. Um, one of the things um, that uh, Sharon, one of the things that we've been, uh, put onto the um, system is that the robot or the help bot will tell someone if they can't 
um, decrypt the message and do they want to continue? So part of it is giving people agency and uh, to um, inform them about what the service is and what um, what they can decide um, as they go along. And we know nothing is safe. Right. Okay. It's just it's. Uh, I mean, ideally, you wouldn't need such messages. I think that's something that we're actively working on. Um, but yeah, it's it's radical transparency. I guess is the thing is just to keep people informed. Consent um, in tech. Consent in tech. Consentful tech. Consent right. Tech. Is that the phrase? Is that what we say now? Consentful tech. Well, I don't know. I think it should be. Okay. <laughs> so, more cynically, then we've got an, we've got several more questions here. Um, how do you cope with uh, unwanted attention? So, do you have people because it's anonymous? Do you have people, you know, flooding the server or just generally being a pain? So do you guys want to talk about the uh, the actual like into the actual server or do you want to like I I mean I think the question had a bit of a tech angle to it so as in mm -hmm. we have uh, some spam protections on matrix.org including uh, software called Molnia um, and I just wondered how you guys were working with the same problems Yeah so we haven't seen um, any kind of spam issue like that um, we did see like I did see that um, Milner is there and uh, have been looking into adding it there. Um, but uh, as of right now, like it's just a- If you haven't sorry? needed it, then that's great. If you haven't needed it, then that's good news. <laughs> yeah, so we haven't, from, from a tech side, we haven't we haven't seen any any attacks or anything yet, um, but I can't speak to like the non-tech side where you have people just, um, you know, starting, starting chats, looking to troll a bit. Yeah. And that was one of the things that we, the worries around it being anonymous, but we also don't know who people are when they're calling us. So it's the, the framing it in a way that, but we need to protect the support workers and let them under, let them know that they don't need to stay on in these moments. And these, unfortunately, these uh, sexual assault centers have been dealing with this kind of issue and these concerns for, well, since the day they began. Yeah, long before there was an internet version of this, I'm sure. I mean, I think- mm -hmm. The the other, sorry, the other thing I was going to quickly mention too is we like we take advantage of Matrix built-in uh, rate limiting, um, which we have to we have to kind of toy a fine line on because we did at one point run into um, a facilitator was getting a lot of chats at once and got right. rate limited out of joining rooms. So we've had to kind of tune that, but um, we have been using that. But again, yeah. no no signs that we've ever had an attack or anything. Super. Well, I mean, it's good to know the tools are there when you need them. Um, and then somebody's asking here: Is there um, you could use you could use this for customer support? Have you thought about commercializing the same the same platform? We we we're busy in this project, but and we one thing I want to say: When I learned that Matrix took five years to come to a place of beautiful fruition, I was like because I didn't understand the tech world is so fast and run, run, run and get going and move and move and move. And I, when I learned that you guys had taken, taken some time, and I'm not saying we're even not even comparing us to matrix, but the, the, the rush on getting to something else um, is, is, it hasn't happened. We've had conversations um, around how this can, um, we can move the, this into, we've had other organizations interested in this. We've had organizations who want to use it for uh, counseling. So less about a crisis support uh, moments, but more around using for counseling, whether it's video counseling or, so we do have interest in the, the, this project for sure. You're muted. We've lost you, Ben. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't <laughs> saying anything very interesting. Uh, I think <laughs> I think this is a, a DevOps question. Um, I think. Let me know. Uh, so, what is your um, what's your configuration of the Twilio bridge? Uh, you're using it to to forward SMS, as I understand it. Is it uh, hosted by Twilio, or is have you got it on premise? Um, and how are you tracking, for example, you know where those messages end up, if if that's even possible? Um, so we like we host it like we host our service. It's a it's an API that was or like a yeah like a microservice created uh, by Sharon uh, that handles like the the bridging between it. It's pretty much um, like anything coming in to to Matrix we put into the Matrix client and we let the bot take it from there. Right. 
Um, and then anything going out is just a straight uh, API call out to Twilio's API um, with the number that it's coming from. Right, gotcha. I think that's all, uh, all the incoming questions we had. Thank you three so much. Were there any last uh, comments you wanted to make? Just a big shout out to you guys. It is an amazing um, API, and it's it actually fulfilled everything that we needed um, in terms of, uh, of what we needed for the sexual assault centers, and we appreciate it. And we're excited about moving forward with it and keep moving uh, and, and expanding, exploring it. So thank you. Thank you. What's this worth? I think it's really, really fun to see it. Uh, used like this into the wild with something properly deployed um, and useful for other people. That's some use cases we've been exploring when we started saying, hey, that's the kind of things you can do. So it's so nice to see people just taking and doing it. So yeah, well done. And thank you for uh, for uh, using Matrix for that. Great. I can second that. It's really motivating to see people helping real people in the real world when working on this. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, but talking of uh, helping people in the real world, uh, <laughs> Will is is also um, doing a lot of it, a lot of his work in his own way. Um, so, Will, uh, you're going to talk a little bit about your your history with with MDN, which I think the half the people on this call are probably on that that website every day. Um, so we owe you a debt there. But you also have a new project called Open Web Docs. Have I got that right? That's right. Yeah. So, hey, Ben. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about Open Web Docs um, and MDN. Um, and I'm going to try and uh, share my screen to show slides, if that's OK now. I have slides. Yeah, definitely. Go. And I'm also going to try and show a small me, if I can work out how to do that. Oh, good luck. That might melt your <laughs> bit. Too. Ben did mention that, but we'll see. OK, there's a small me. Let's see how that works. OK, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk, talk about Open Web Docs. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself. My name is Will Bamberg. I'm a technical writer and what people call a documentation engineer, which means that uh, I spend a lot of time working on documentation systems and docs infrastructure, as well as writing content. Um, I've worked at Mozilla for a long time in MDN. And then I worked at Element on the matrix specification. And now I'm working for an organization called Open Web Docs. And again, back on MDN. Uh, I tend to assume that people know what MDN is. Um, well, let's, let's, let's start by talking about Open Web Docs. So, so the, the most concise way I can say what Open Web Docs is, is that it's um, an organization where people and organizations and companies uh, fund the Open Web Docs project, which can then hire full-time technical writers who can create and maintain open web documentation. And for now, but not necessarily forever, we are focused on MDN. So I tend to assume people know what MDN is already, but, but if you don't, MDN is a website that hosts web documentation, so documentation for JavaScript, CSS, HTML, uh, and web APIs, are the kind of the kind of core of the site. Um, it's a big site. It's about altogether. It's about ten thousand pages. Um, about five thousand just on web APIs. About a thousand on JavaScript. About a thousand on CSS. It's, I mean, it's 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 quite a big site. Um, it's pretty widely used. It gets quite a lot of traffic, and it's it's I think generally seen as as a pretty much of a standard reference for uh, web standards. Uh, it's been around a long time. It started in about two thousand five, I think. Um, and in the early days of MDN, it didn't really differentiate between uh, what we now think of as open web web standard technology like JS and CSS and HTML, and like Mozilla proprietary tech, uh, things like Zool and XPCOM. And I think like back then there wasn't really so much of a distinction between those things. And um, MDN or MDC as it was called then didn't really make that distinction. So that the, the I have a link. I don't know if you can see this, but the, the homepage of MDN. Or MDC in 2008 is like very much a, a, a Mozilla a Firefox thing, and and, and it, it does talk about web standards, but they're all kind of mixed in with just stuff that Mozilla was inventing at the time. Um, and it, what happened in the 2010s, really, and this took a long time, I think. Um, MDN became seen as 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 a 
as a reference for web standard documentation primarily rather than like a kind of Mozilla specific thing. Um, one of the things that that kind of marked that was um, there was an attempt in 2012 to 2015 by browser vendors and kind of browser adjacent companies to set up an independent uh, web documentation site. They called it web platform. And so this was like Google and Adobe and Nokia and W3C. Uh, who basically weren't really very comfortable with Mozilla owning the, doc the docs for the web. So they wanted to have their own thing. Um, and this didn't really succeed, I, th I think, because MDN already existed and it kind of served people's needs pretty well. Um, and so that not succeeding, I think, kind of marked MDN being seen as like the standard reference for the web. Um, and I think one of the things that made this happen was a, a commitment from the MDN team, from the people working on it, um, to being independent and, and, and keeping this kind of separation between the kind of Mozilla stuff and the web standards stuff, and really kind of focusing a lot of their attention on the web standard documentation MDN. And that just kind of got better and better during that decade. And I think it, it really showed um, in the way it was, it was seen. And one of the things that happened then was um, the formation of a thing called the MDN Product Advisory Board, which was like 2017, 2018. And the first uh, members of this were W3C, Google, and Microsoft, and Samsung. And this was a kind of a, a mechanism for these companies to have some kind of formal input into MDN. Um, and it was a way to make them feel more comfortable with kind of recognizing recognizing MDN as as as, as the place um, everyone should really collaborate on web documentation, um, and because they had this kind of this 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 mechanism for providing input, it, I think it made them happier about the fact that it was a Mozilla property. But at this point, there was still no actual financial commitment to MDN from from these companies. It was just advisory. What happened then was in 2020, Mozilla laid off a lot of people, including a lot of people who are working in MDN. And the members of the Product Advisory Board saw in this an opportunity for them to basically to help out, to, to collectively invest in MDN, to kind of help to kind of safeguard its future as, as an independent um, web doc site. And the vehicle they chose for this is Open Web Docs. So that's like the, the, the kind of path to how we got to this thing called Open Web Docs. Who's in Open Web Docs? Currently, Open Web Docs employs two people. Uh, one is me, and one is someone called Florian Schultz. Uh, me and Florian are both technical writers. Um, we both have a lot of experience of working on docs infrastructure. And we both have a lot of experience with MDN. Um, we're also going to be hiring. We intend to hire two more people this year. Uh, it was always the plan when when um, the PAB set up Open Web Docs that they'd want to hire four people for now. And so that's kind of still the plan. What do we do? Well, at the moment, we work on MDN 100%. But that's not necessarily limited to MDN in the future. We, we, we are talking about doing some work with W3C and helping uh, figure out ways to write specifications in a more accessible way. Um, and so I expect we will start working on other projects. But for now, it's just MDN. We work really closely with Mozilla. We, we talk to them about their roadmaps. We do triage with them. We kind of assess projects with them. But we have our own roadmap. So we decide what to work on, but we do collaborate a lot with Mozilla. In a little more detail, we so uh, one thing to say about MDN is that it, the content now lives in GitHub. This is a relatively new change. MDN was a wiki for a long time. Uh, and in the last six months, uh, it migrated into GitHub. And that means we get a lot of issues coming in. We get a lot of pull requests coming in. So one of the things that me and Florian do is review PRs and fix docs bugs that people file. And this is kind of little stuff that is just kind of background work. We also take on bigger content and infrastructure projects. So a couple here, one that Florian's working on in collaboration with Mike Smith from W3C, is a project to um, 
improve the way we represent spec URLs and MDNs. So web platform features are defined in specifications. And our docs pages link to these specs. So if you want to know what the spec says about a thing, you can easily find it. The way we do this in MDN at the moment is a little chaotic. Uh, a lot of the links are pointing to outdated specs, or they're just 404, or they're missing. Um, and when they are present, they're quite often just um, represented inconsistently in the documentation. So this is an effort to um, kind of extract these URLs from the pages and keep them in a separate machine readable format so we can so we can lint them and we can make them available to other kinds of applications and we can kind of slurp them into MDN pages and represent them all in a consistent way. Um, the other project which I'm working on in collaboration with Mozilla is to convert MDN's authoring format from HTML to Markdown. And I'll talk about that a little more later on. The third thing that we do is, is help people who want to contribute to the docs. So MDN gets a lot of volunteer contributors. I think even though it's only been in GitHub for a few months, we recently got the 500th uh, individual contributor to the, to the repo. So we get a lot of people showing up trying to help. Uh, MDN is kind of complicated, um, and there's a lot of kind of there's a lot of sort of convention you have to deal with, and so we kind of help volunteers to be successful in their contributions. How do we get money? We uh, survive on donations. We get big and small donations from both companies and individuals. Um, we're hosted by Open Collective, and all of our finances are open. You can go to our Open Collective page, and you can see exactly who funds us and how much they give us and how much money we have in the bank and all that stuff and what we spend it on. Um, at the moment, we, get, we, we have a few large donors. I think it would be a good thing for us to have more donors and more smaller donors. I think it would help us be more resilient and have to have more kind of funding diversity. And that's the thing we want to, to do better at in the future. How do we decide what to work on? Um, we have a process for this that's kind of work in progress. Um, anyone can file issues for Open Web Docs to pick up as a docs project. We have um, a kind of template that you can write for bigger pieces of work that sort of explain you know why you think this thing is a problem, and uh, why you think it's a problem that's that's worth how that's worth spending time and money fixing, and what we think this you think the solution should look like. Um, and we have a set of public criteria um, that we can use to assess the issues that get filed. And we every month or so we have a meeting where we go through all of these projects, project proposals, and we decide which ones. Well, we we rank them basically, and ones that get a higher rank are more likely to end up on our roadmap. We also have a steering committee, which is super important to our work, and its members represent kind of browser vendors and browser adjacent companies and organizations like. Google and Igalia and W3C. And some of these organizations are sponsors and funders, and some of them aren't. But they're all people who kind of care about, care about the web and care about MDN. And they help us prioritize work. So I was going to talk a little bit about this project I'm working on that I just started working on, which is to convert MDN's authoring format from HTML to Markdown. Um, currently, MDN's authored in raw HTML, and creating new pages involves basically writing a load of HTML. Editing pages involves editing HTML. This is kind of difficult, and it's error prone, as I'm sure you know. It's super easy to do things like missing off closing tags or getting your nesting wrong or, or this and that. Um, so we want to start using Markdown instead. Um, this is complicated because MDN has been around for a long time. And for a lot of that time, it was in the wiki. And for all of that time, there was no 
real quality control of edits that happened. There was no review staff. And so in the 15 years that happened, all kinds of stuff has ended up in the markup, which wouldn't survive well if you just converted it straight into like GitHub flavored markdown or something like that. Um, and also, then is huge. Like I say, it's it's ten thousand pages. Um, so, yeah. The approach we're taking to this is to start off just converting the JS docs, which itself is about a thousand pages. So it's it's still quite big, but it's not like scarily big. And the JS docs are in relatively good shape because they've had more um, kind of careful curation, I think, over the years. So a lot of things are not such big problems there. But there are still enough problems there for us to, um, to, to, to resolve a lot of these issues just to get to the point of having the JS docs in Markdown. And so this process is like working out what bits of HTML we're using in the JS docs that are going to give us problems. Um, and then for those features, whether we can just like stop doing that thing and simplify our docs, or if we decide we do want to keep doing them, in what ways you need to extend GitHub flavored markdown in order to support those features. So that's kind of writing specifications for, for how we want to represent uh, um, our docs. And then based on that, we can design a conversion process that will actually make this conversion into markdown and then update the platform code in MDN to kind of do the reverse and take the markdown and, and render it out as web pages. Um, so a lot of the the conversion and the changes in the platform are going to get done by the Mozilla MDN dev team. So I'm working super closely with those people on this project. And I also want to talk a little bit about this is uh, like future directions we, we, we could have for MDN that I'd, I'd like to see us have. Um, so web platform features what um one of the important things to describe about web platform features is which browsers support them um which we call browse compatibility so if you're if you're a developer and you want to use a feature it's it's important for you to know which browser this is going to work in um whether you can actually use the thing at all or not um and up until about five years ago this information was represented just kind of statically in our pages as um, uh, HTML tables. And so there are about, you know, however many, several thousand HTML tables across all of our docs, and each one was kind of handwritten. And each one sort of had its own way of expressing browser compatibility as they kind of gradually diverge. Um, and if you wanted to change the way you want to, to kind of um, render or visualize compatibility, you had to edit every single different table. Um, and there are a lot of errors in the data and, and so on. And so we started a project where we thought this browser compat is basically data. Um, and so let's treat it like data. And so we, we extract this out of the pages and we basically put in a load of gigantic JSON files with a JSON schema. And we updated MDN so it could slurp that data out of the JSON files and build tables as a kind of build step. And this was really cool, and one of the one of the uh, cool things about it is that it means that other applications and other websites can now make use of that data. It's not like it's it's not trapped inside MDN the website. It's kind of liberated, so it, it, it can be useful to other people. And so one thing that happens now is, can I use is powered by the same data? Um, and there are editors and there are dev tools that can use the same data. Um, so I think this is really powerful, um, and I'd like to do it for more bits of MDN. Um, it's, I think it's in the nature of reference documentation that it has this kind of high degree of structure. And at the moment in MDN, we don't really uh, make use of that. We kind of treat it as just prose. And I think if we can extract these, this structured data and treat it like data, I think that's better for writers because they don't have to worry about how the stuff gets rendered. And it's enormously better for consumers because it means that we can use the state to power lots of different applications. Um, and MDN, the website, is just like one application of it. So that's a direction I'd like us to take MDN in if, uh, if we can manage that.
I wanted to finish off, off, off by thinking a bit about like how Open Web Docs relates to this um, series of talks. Open Tech will save us, um, and you know what what open means in Open Web Docs and why we think it's important. Um, so I, I I think that the place to start for me here is to say that web developers deserve documentation that they can trust to serve their needs, that it's not just serving the needs of a particular company with a particular tech they want to sell, um, that it has its own, it has its own kind of like editorial independence, really. Um, and I think it's it's important for web developers to, to, to feel that, that they can trust the docs, really. Um, and there are a couple of things about open web docs that I think should help with that. Uh, one is the idea of openness as, resi as resilience. So if open web docs is not dependent on any single organization, then it's much harder for it to, well, stop existing or be kind of, you know, subverted or just, just kind of rot away through neglect. Um, so the idea that open web docs has multiple sponsors and multiple backers, and there are a whole bunch of organizations in the steering committee who care about it, I think is a thing that makes it more resilient. And the other thing is openness as transparency. So the fact that we are transparent about how we decide what to work on, that we have these kind of public criteria that say, you know, if you if you file an issue, this is how we'll decide whether we think we want to work on it or not. And that, you know, our, 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 our minutes for these kinds of discussions are all just public, I think, is a thing that contributes to this degree of trust. And that's all. Super. Thank you, Will. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. There's um there's a couple of links that people are going to be interested in. Um, GitHub.com slash MDN, right, is where the bulk of the data work is done. Have I got that right? Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. So well, well, um GitHub.com slash MDN is the MDN organization on GitHub. Um, the content for the MDN website is MDN slash content. Um, browser compact data lives in its own repo called browser compact data. Um, there are some, there are, there are like a, a ton of repos under there, but the, the, the main, the main one is content. Um, yeah. And open web Docs has its own organization that doesn't really have anything in it because almost all the work we do lives in the, in the MDN side. Yeah. I've just been stalking you all over the internet. Um, and one, <laughs> one other thing I also noticed was, um, you're working with open collective. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess this is as a, uh, to have some sort of parent structure. I don't know if you want to comment on the benefits you get from them. I don't, honestly, I don't know very much about that. All right. Um, I, I mean, I believe so. I believe one thing that they, they provide for us is they, they collect money on our behalf, right? So okay. essentially, if you want to, if you want to give us money, you go to Open Collective and you, they will help you. <laughs> right. Okay. Help so you give us money and then they'll make sure the money gets to us, right? So a yeah, financial right. umbrella. To, to, yeah, to fiscal it. fiscal host is the phrase that I've I've been I've been taught to say about I this. I see. Yeah. All um, right. And there's a, there's like a we 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 do this kind of monthly work log thing where we basically write a blog post about here's the stuff Will and Florian did last month, and yeah. uh, that lives in Open Collective too. Um, yeah. So we don't we don't have any kind of proper like uh, you know blogging like sort of presence. Um, right. Because we. Well, I mean, you should be the experts on how to make. a Kind of, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Yeah. I did. I did think about interrupting you when you said that HTML was too difficult, so you were switching to uh, Markdown. I thought, gosh, that's not your, not your normal brand. Anyway. <laughs> um, oh, uh, so a couple of questions coming in. Uh, Noah, who probably knows the answer to this already, asks, uh, "Did you learn anything while working on Matrix's new spec documentation project um, that has been applicable to your new work?" That's yeah, I did. I learned. I learned. I I think so. Um, so one of the things, one of the interesting things. So this this. So like I said before, I mean, I mean, I, I mean for, for the longest time, MDM was in a wiki, and and I, it, I don't know that that may, that that may have been a good choice for a while, but I think it stopped being a good choice some time ago for for MDM, you know, and and uh, and it's been a long a long haul to get it um, into GitHub. Um, 
and and it actually happened while I wasn't there, um, and so I came back, and it was in it was in GitHub, yeah. Um, and this opens up lots of possibilities for things you can do with the docs. And so one of the things you have at the moment that you have now is um, that docs are, are represented like there's HTML and then there's front matter, and you can you yep. can uh, keep interesting bits of metadata in the front matter. Um, and I think one of the things I did at, at, at um, Element was, you know, I, I, I took the matrix back and I, and, I, and I stuffed it inside Hugo. And so I, I, I learned a bunch about that and about how, you know, different ways that, that, that static site generators deal with these kinds of problems of, you know, like having, you know, using Markdown, which is super nice to, to write, but is super limited. You know, how do you, how do you make it like um, powerful enough to do right. the things you want to do? Yeah. Um, and there's this kind of tension, I think, always for something like Markdown. Um, so you know, like 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 Hugo has these has short codes and it has templates, mm -hmm. and it has the idea of like like page types as well. So you say this kind of page is a, is a is a blog post, and so blog posts have this particular layout, and so that's this kind of metadata about um, at, a, at a kind of high level the kind of stuff you should have in a particular type of page. And I think that's super interesting for MDN because I'd love to see a future for MDN where you can say this page is a CSS property page. And therefore, it must have browser combat data, and it must have a spec table, and it must have, uh, you know, a bunch of examples. Yeah, um, and then you could even lint the the pages. Right. To, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so this is my this is part of my kind of dream of of, of structured content. So it was, it was mm -hmm. it's really interesting to be able to bring some of those ideas. I think. Um, and so I've you know yeah. So I, I so MDN has this uh, macro system called CumaScript. Which is kind of you know it's 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 MDN's homegrown equivalent of what Hugo does with with Hugo templates, right? And actually, just yesterday, I managed to well, <laughs> I filed a bug that basically said so. So we have front matter, and there's this macro system, but the macros can't access the things in front matter. So it's like okay, so I, I filed a bug a few weeks ago. Say, can we just access everything in front matter? Just just mm -hmm. dump it in the namespace, and then the macros can use all this stuff. And that actually got merged yesterday. And this is like tiny change that I think is like this huge potential for MDN because now I can just we can just have organized metadata and front matter. Yeah. And now now our macros can can just can, can just use that. I mean, I must say that seems like a huge oversight in the original that they couldn't access the, their own page data. But that's you know. well. Um, front matter is new though. Front matter is in in the old wiki pages there was okay. no front matter. So so it's a, it's 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 only become a possibility since the the movement to GitHub. Gotcha. So yeah, it has very much so. I think all all that all that stuff about you know, um, yeah. I had a quick question, Will. Um, and by the way, thank you for um, talking uh, us through this. It's really really cool. Um, but I'm getting this amazing feeling of deja vu. And first of all, because I think I've asked you this question before, but I'm going to ask you it again. <laughs> but also because I think I've seen this whole um, situation play out before in some ways. Um, back in the late 90s, um, when Netscape was going to a particularly dark place, um, there was at one point where basically the only place that JavaScript was documented was on the Netscape website. And so anybody doing kind of early dynamic web programming and wanted to look at the DOM API or indeed the kind of J JavaScript APIs would find themselves on the Netscape developer docs. And it was the one source of truth and the absolute crown jewels. And then one day Netscape was in a really bad place and it disappeared. And people started <laughs> using like random mirrors that they kind of scraped off sort of precursors to the internet archive in order to know how JavaScript worked and what the DOM uh, actually was. And then eventually, somewhere out of the show, out of the kind of um, ashes, rose what became the MDN or MDC. Um, but after like a hiatus of about six months uh, or a year or something like that, or at least it seemed to go on forever. And it was really scary that basically the custodian of uh, the web API seemed to have kind of given up on it We're in the middle of organizational chaos, much as Mozilla itself obviously rose from the ashes too. And I was just one, uh, I guess this was before you got involved with yeah. MDC, but I'm wondering if there are any sort of war stories or parallels between the way in which MDN has um, split from Mozilla and then been reborn in a new vehicle. Um, it kind of feels like it's all happening again. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, MDN is still um, is still in Mozilla, and it and, it, and I mean, MD, Mozilla is still the biggest contributor, like financial contributor to to MDN as well. I mean, they, uh, so Mozilla uh, 
you know, pays for all of the operational costs of running the website and employs all the developers who work on it, and also uh, employs writers too. That um, mostly, I think, at the moment, contractors, but you know, also like so, 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 so Mozilla contributes more financially to to MDN than than the open web box backers do. Um, I. I mean, I do think, and this is this is, I guess, kind of the you know the the, the point about resilience, really. That you know, if if I, I think I think there was this so there was this period between like 2017 and 2020 when there was this thing called the PAB, which which had companies like Google and Microsoft and W3C like involved with MDN, but because they weren't contributing financially, it was entirely advisory, right? It was it was it was you know, and 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 I think their leverage was was kind of you know smaller as a result of that you know and i think um what happened in 2020 made 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 these companies think well we should we should you know we should help we should invest and, and help to safeguard mdm so in that sense i think that's true um but it's still it's still very much part of mozilla you know and okay. i think in terms of like the kind of organizational you know futures for mdm and mozilla and open web docs i don't know you know, I guess the big there, difference there are, there are is different ways that could work out. When Netscape went and totally failed to realize the value of the documentation and literally let it just drop off the surface of the um, site, it's a very different situation where we have everybody ganging together to almost, uh, as you say, give it more resilience. So we're in a, a much better place. I think so. I think I think there's a yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot of recognition that, that that it's that it's worth you know worth supporting. Um, at least I hope there is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got two more questions. Um, we've got one technical one to start with. Uh, Matrix OD, not sure that's a real human name. Uh, says, do you, did you look? Uh, well, you weren't around for this, but did you? Did your team talk about uh, DITA, D-I-T-A, as a um, as a markup format? Um, seems to be a structured XML um, technical documentation format. I don't know if that was considered. Um. We we've we, we've talked about uh, different formats to use, uh, different non HTML formats to use for authoring, um, and I yeah I we so we, we we did we did consider this. Uh, I think that I mean <laughs> there's a there's a there's a lot to dislike about Markdown, and it has a lot of problems. I think it, it doesn't have as many problems as it used to have. I think at least there's a spec now, uh, which helps. Uh, but it's still incredibly limited in terms of things you can do. You can do with it, and especially things like semant like it has no semantics, right? right. Whereas for some is, is 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 you know it's all yeah. about that, right? Um, so there's a, there's a lot to dislike about Markdown, and there's a lot to like about something like Ditter. But I think ultimately, just the ease of authoring makes makes it hard not to choose Markdown, um, and then to try and deal with the with the 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 problems you get with it, which is the road we're on. And I yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you sound ambivalent a little, perhaps. You know, no, you I'm not. I'm not actually. I mean, I, I wish, I wish there was something that was perfect and didn't involve you making difficult trade-offs, but I don't think there is. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, I think that's a good answer. Um, so there was one more. Oh, um, what question? Uh, what questions? What uh, projects um, need improved documentation, and could open? Uh, could your project support them? Um, you mean on MDN? What what web docs? Yeah, in general, like as in what what open projects out there just don't have lacking documentation? Certainly not Matrix. Um, but what projects could do with better documentation? And, and is it something that open web docs could could keep under their umbrella? I guess. Um, I guess. Well, it's it's. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I guess that sounds like it's outside of MDN, right? That's not asking about what what. Aspects of web docs, particularly. I mean, I, so for instance, like keeping it in the world of web docs. One of the things we've been talking about at, at Open Web Docs is documentation for, for for web views, which which doesn't really exist much in MDN right now, and mm -hmm. is kind of an important issue for a lot of people. Um, and that's kind of a gap in our docs that we've been talking about how we can address this, um, which I think is 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 an interesting gap, right? And that's something which we we would address by improving the docs in MDN. Um, but I don't know if that's quite what no, the question I, 
I, I, yeah, I, I think he just wanted your opinion on, uh, on, on how else you, you could keep going, I think. All right, Will, thank you so much. Um, I want to remind people that they can, they can donate to Open Web Docs. Um, in fact, if you just go to openwebdocs.org, it will redirect you to the right place. Is, is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Thank you, Ben, for, ha for having me. It was, uh, it was really, really fun. No problem. Thank you. Woo. All right, we have another contender. Um, we have Bruno. Um, I, I have not uh, checked out the latest um, hydrogen. I, when I ran it last week, it was it was buzzing along smoothly. Um, right. But I really would love Fairly to. Recent. Run. Yeah, I mean that's recent. I mean I used to run it every day, um, but I haven't uh, I, I haven't had time to to, to to play with it right now. Um, but yeah, Bruno, why don't you say hello um, and, and introduce your project? Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Bruno. Just gonna share my screen. Um, I hope I share the right one. No, that's the wrong one. Got two monitors with the same name, so that's helpful. Luckily, your element was open to a public room already. Exactly. I anticipated that. <laughs> and, and show my slides. There we go. I think you should just keep the background, actually. We could just stare at it <laughs> happily for 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, out of Bruno's window, there's a, there's a pretty good view, I recall. Uh, not anymore since this week. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, um, right. Hello, everyone. I'm Bruno. I'm a front, dev at, uh, front end dev at Element. And um, I've been working on this project for over two years now um, um, called Hydrogen. Um, so for people who don't know what it is yet, it's a matrix client, um, similar to, if you will, elements, but it's still a lot more bare bones, um, less featureful and, uh, and more basic. Um, so it started as a spare time project for me. Um, I had a Windows phone at the time and I'm just gonna move my Jitsi so it's less confusing and distracting. Right. Um, so I had a, a Windows phone and uh, I started, I joined Element and I really wanted a matrix client on my phone. I didn't want to switch phones. So uh, I started writing one and uh, um, Windows phone was a dying platform. So I said, I'll make it a web client. I had some ideas how we could leverage um, uh, browser technology better to make a really fast client, which was also needed because I had a slow phone. So I started this project and uh, kept evolving it. Then last year, in summer, it became a, a work time project, uh, and we rebranded it to. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, no, um, and we rebranded it from Brawl, which was, it was called to to Hydrogen, and and here we are today. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of the technicalities of of uh, or maybe not so brief of Hydrogen, how it works um, internally. Uh, so yeah, this is what it looks like. Um, so um, there's some overarching principles, um, some are fairly uh, generic, like inversion of control. Um, there's no global states. Uh, all the state is handled by passing dependencies to uh, classes that need it. Um, this makes things so much easier and uh, like unit tests are easier to write. Um, like features like uh, multi-account or even the grid view. Um, those things all become easier if, if you don't make assumptions about how many of something you'll have or or where you should find one. Um, then multi-platform, currently Hydrogen is only a, a web client, but um, I do hope someday to, uh, to have the time to add other platforms to that and have very much engineered the code in a way that that is going to be as, as painless as possible. So, uh, this would, of course, still be in JavaScript, but um, some native UI libraries have bindings for JavaScript, like GTK. Um, also, you could run uh, the Hydrogen JavaScript SDK inside a JavaScript uh, engine uh, off screen and have that communicate with a native UI layer. Um, there's lots of possibilities there. Um, but yeah, the code is very much engineered to, to support that, even though that's not a thing yet today. Then um, to support the uh, multi-platform goal, uh, the, view the, view, the view layer is kept very thin and uses a pattern called MVVM or view, model view view model. Um, 
I will get deeper into that later on. Um, there's also um, the whole model and storage is very stateful and incremental. And nowadays it's it's can be fashionable to sort of say, well, on every change, recalculate the world and then make a diff and uh, see how those two different states um, are different. And you can definitely see why you would want to do that because you only have one update path that way. And with stateful incremental models, you basically have two paths. You have to initialize your model and then also um, and then also do the updates incrementally. So um, the uh, yeah, the idea is to do as little as possible. And, and with these incremental changes, it's it's definitely possible to uh, yeah to do less work and thus hopefully be more performant. Um, and then great offline support. Before all this uh, COVID, I spend a lot of time on trains, um, and uh, connection is not always great. So uh, for me personally, it was really important to have good offline support. Uh, so you can just uh, yeah read your messages, reply to them, and once your connectivity comes back up, everything gets sent and and all goes out. Um, and another thing, store the intent. It's it's frustrating if software if you uh do something in, in an app and then something goes wrong you need to reopen it or something and then that in time gets lost um so it tries to hydrogen tries to adopt the pattern of storing the intent first as the first thing that happens then doing the action and then storing the results um of course this doesn't make sense everywhere but yeah where where it makes sense it tries to do that and then one in parentheses because i'm, I'm Currently, it's the case, but I'm not sure I'll, I'll be able to keep pulling that off. There's no build system for the local development, which is really nice. Uh, currently, you just have a static web server, and it serves your code. You write in uh, your editor just as uh, ECMAScript modules, and that just all gets loaded in the browser, and there's no transpiler. And it's just, you're, yeah, you're so much closer to the browser. You don't have to second-guess tooling. If something goes wrong, uh, you get errors that come straight from the browser and, and in my experience, make more sense. Um, so that's something I would like to keep, but um, it, there's a bit of tension with other things, like, for example, type type checking. Uh, TypeScript currently yeah, assumes you're transpiling your code, so you can't really do TypeScript. TypeScript does support um, type checking through JS doc annotations, which you can do in normal JavaScript, and that's something I'm playing with to see if, if I can get best of both worlds that way. Um, yeah, so I've, I've drawn a little diagram here of um, of uh, the layers sort of in the app. Um, uh, it's a bit of an onion architecture, if you will. Um, so the coupling goes from the outer circles to the inner circles and, and to the lateral sides, but not the other way around. So as I mentioned, the goal is to have a, a, an architecture where it's easy to support multiple platforms. So you have the blue code. Uh, or the blue layers and the green ones. Uh, and the green is the code that would be shared uh, amongst different versions for different platforms of hydrogen. And blue, you would have to sort of uh, write for every platform. And I've also put in the um, the amount of code in each uh, as, as line, lines of code uh, to give you a rough, rough estimate of how how yeah the size of the app is, is distributed amongst those layers. So you got UI that only knows about view models. Then the view models, uh, and that's in the domain layer. Uh, those know about navigation and also about the matrix layer, which is uh, sort of the matrix layer is sort of um, opinionated to support the best to be a, uh, yeah to be a good SDK or, or library to write clients. Maybe less so for generic SDK cases. I guess you could write a bot with it. Um, you'd have some stuff that you don't really need for a bot, but uh, yeah, more exotic matrix uh, things. Uh, yes, yeah, it could could be supported, but it's not really meant for that. Um, then you got uh, storage, um, which is of course platform dependent. In the browser, we use IndexedDB. Um, yeah, on other platforms, you could choose any key value store um, like LevelDB or what you have. And then there's the platform layer. Um, this um, gives the matrix layer and the domain layer access to platform specific things like cryptographic primitives and uh, just opening a file dialog or scaling, making a thumbnail of an image that all goes in there. 
Um, so yeah, the UI is is, is very small uh, currently. It's also very bare bones, as you've seen in the screenshots. It's it's uh, there's a lot of things missing. So um, yeah, but I'm trying to keep that as small as possible, right? So one uh, pattern that is used extensively is observables, and um, observable values are sort of a kind of common thing. Observable collections are less common. I think they're a thing in um, in .NET. I've not come across them so much uh, elsewhere. Um, but it's basically just a, your normal collection, but it emits events on, on changes, like an add event, update event, or remove event when things get changed. So it's a live collection, if you will. And we've got maps, uh, which just are key to values. And then those have operators that create new maps or, or other collections. So it's a bit of, like the map operator actually um, is a projection to another type as you have the map function on arrays in JavaScript as well. Uh, so it's confusing with observable map here, but um, yeah, that's just converting it to another function, uh, to another value, all the, all the values in that map. Then there's filter and there's sort. Um, filter is sort of self-evident. You just reduce the number of things according to a, a, a predicate. And then sort gives you a list according to a sorting function. And uh, a list, an observable list is um, yeah, mapping just an index to a value rather than a key. And, and you can also map lists to other other values. And I'll give an example in the next slide. An observable value is is really um, yeah. You've got reactive uh, what is it called? Um, reactive RxJS. It's similar to that. Um, in hydrogen, it's mainly used to um, to help with asynchronous state machines. Um, I'll give an example of that later as well. So this is, for example, um, how to get the room list to render it, like the left column in the app, um, from the session, which is sort of your logged in user session. You do the rooms property that gives you an observable map. Then you you project that or map that to um, a view model. So every room gets converted to a view model. That gives you a new observable map. And then you sort that map. Um, so room tile view model here has compare method to sort view models amongst each other. Um, so you sort those view models and then you get the room list. And this can be immediately rendered by uh, the list view. Um, that's a generic component to render observable collections. So every update that happens in the session.rooms will automatically cause it uh, cause the UI to update in that way without any further code. So that's, that's sort of a nice pattern. Um, and this is an example of an observable value. We've got the sync um, status here. Uh, while starting the app, we wait. We have to wait for the first sync to to finish, and this is sort of how that would be done. Um, yeah. So, um, can have a look at the matrix layer. Uh, as I mentioned in the future, that will probably that might be uh, uh, exposed as an SDK. Other apps can use as well. So, uh, I've put all the classes in bold that would sort of as a SDK consumer you would get in touch with. The others are sort of more private and implementation details. Uh, we've got the session container, which allows you to um, either log in or um, uh, restore a previous session where you've logged in. Um, you need to pass it in the platform as we saw before, and also OLM, uh, uh, the OLM library, which we use for end-to-end -end encryption. It's very platform dependent how that gets loaded. So you pass those two in, you get a session container, you can log in, restore a session. Um, and once that's done, uh, so you get the session object. And then that has the rooms property, which is this observable map, mapping room IDs to rooms, which you can iterate or uh, just get a room by its ID or just observe the whole map and render that uh, as you want. Then once you get a room, um, you can open the timeline on, on it. Um, so by default, yeah, the, the, the events in a room are not kept in memory. Only once you open the room, only once you open the timeline, rather, uh, they are kept in memory and, and updated. So you have to explicitly open the timeline. Um, and in the timeline, you'll find entries. 
an event entry or a pending event entry, which is sort of the local echo for that. And then we also got this thing called fragment bound boundary entries. So the timeline is split up into fragments. And uh, uh, at the boundary, you'll get these entries. And those basically represent the gap. I'll, I'll get more into fragments later on. But So within a room, you also have the room summary, which sort of keeps track of all the data to just display a room in the, in the left panel. And also some flags. Um, then you got the sync writer. Uh, there's a lot of delegation to keep classes small. Uh, the send queue, uh, when you send messages. Room encryption, which deals with all the encryption. Um, um, and then in session, yeah, we've got more stuff to support encryption. Um, uh, device message handler, device tracker, and the end-to-end -end account. Um, yeah, and then the session container also um, is sort of orchestrating. Uh, for example, if you lose your connection to to, uh, to start seeing if the connection comes back, uh, that happens there in the reconnector, and then the session container will tell the session, hey, you should send anything you have and, and, and check yeah, your back online, basically. Same for the, sync, uh, for the request scheduler. This does rate limiting and is all handled outside of session. Um, right. So... A big thing in a matrix client is syncing, and um, uh, this there's sort of a life cycle um, for the whole sync for one sync to occur, and uh, yeah, the biggest the biggest part of that is in the room. Um, so you've got five steps. Every time you um, you get a sync response back. So yeah, syncing a matrix happens through long polling. So every time you have a token and you call the server with that token and then you get the latest messages and a new token and then you you call the the sync api again so in that response you've got a response for every room and that's what we're seeing here in prepare sync you also get new keys which um are sent us also in the in the in the sync response they're already decrypted here uh and uh they're sent to the room where the keys apply so um the reason here there's a pre separate prepare and, and write sync step is that decryption uh, of new messages and end-to-end -end rooms happens asynchronously. And um, because we want to um, uh, parallelize it and uh, also, um, well, basically because decryption can happen in a web worker and that makes it asynchronous by, it, by itself um, for slower browsers and also uh, to make it faster. So that's why, um, um, yeah, and so one other detail to mention is that our storage layer, IndexedDB, it will auto-commit transactions uh, if you call a network API. So that's why it had to be split up into these prepare sync, after prepare sync, and write sync steps. Because to be able to, do, to write the sync, we need to have the message decrypted because we will update the room summary with the latest timestamp, the, the, the last message you got in this room. So the first thing we need to do is the decryption, basically. That's what happens in prepare sync. Um, so it gets the room response and the new keys for that room, and it returns a prep preparation object. And that same preparation object gets passed to the after prepare sync, which will do the actual decryption asynchronously, as we said. And then uh, once that's done, uh, write sync will get called with a transaction, which is the same transaction for all the rooms in that sync response. So we will write um, all the changes in all the rooms for the sync response in one transaction. And it has this very nice property that um, either a sync response is written and um, is, uh, is, is updating the UI, or it hasn't happened at all. So our sync token is always in sync with the state of the other stores because everything gets written in one transaction. Um, so yeah, you, get, you can see the prep uh, in write sync will contain the cryptic messages, and then the room response for, yeah, for the, the rest of what needs to be synced, and then a transaction. And this gives a change, changes object um, because write sync will not affect its own in-memory state at all. Uh, it, puts everything in this changes object. Um, because if another room goes wrong, these rooms are all writing their sync in parallel. And if any room goes wrong, we basically want to stop sync and not 
do any updates. So all the rooms that are in the sink, they create these changes objects. And then uh, this gets passed to after sync, which will apply the changes to its own in-memory state of the room and also emit the updates. And this is where the UI will get updated. This will uh, trigger updates in the observable collections and, and, and will push updates, basically. So once that all is done, your UI is updated. Um, but there might still be some work uh, caused by the sync that we need to do asynchronously. And as I said before, we can't do asynchronous work uh, within the context of a storage transaction. So we need to do separate steps for that. So work here is often if, if somebody new joins. Quick interjection, uh, Bruno. We have yes. a question uh, from the room. So where is the decryption done? Does, the, does this mean that the uh, messages and room summaries are stored decrypted, or is that um, just for UI? Well, actually, yeah, it's a good question because um, it's still something I'm, I'm currently it, the room summary won't store um, the last message body, but it's definitely a feature we want. It's very nice to see the last message in your left panel. Mm -hmm. And the room summary is what powers the, the left panel, basically. Um, so um, we, we also don't want to store, like you said, um, messages unencrypted on disk. So um, I think for encrypted rooms, I won't, uh, I won't store the message in the room summary data. Right. Um, but uh, the decryption happens in the after prepare sync. Uh, there it calls into the room encryption object and which will call into Megalm, the Megalm decryption for that room. Um, I hope yeah. that answers the question. Yeah, I think, I think so. Okay. Will that be a performance problem that you'll have to go back to the room to get the, the preview message? No, because um, in that case, I will probably split up the um, process of loading the room list in two steps. And uh, the first step would be what I'm doing now. And the second step would be loading um, the uh, the last message for that room. Gotcha. And um, we, can, we can store other things in the room summary, like the event ID of the last event. Uh, and that will make it a lot faster to find out which event needs to be decrypted. And we can all decrypt all those events probably in parallel. Um, so yeah, you might see like on a slow device, a flash of a second where you don't see your last messages in the left panel then, but that right. that shouldn't slow things down now. All right, I'll let um, you carry on. Yeah. yeah, happy to be interjected with questions, by the way. Um, Right, so that was a bit technical, but that's uh, yeah, that's a core thing in the matrix layer, the the the, the room sync life cycle. Um, and the session, by the way, has something similar, but um, is not as involved as as a room because there's also things that needs to be synced at the session level. Um, right. So then, yeah, you mentioned pushing updates in the after sync stage. Um, there's basically a few ways that the matrix layer will push a. a will push updates. So for single items, uh, it just uses a plain old event emitter, which will have a change event. And then um, for um, things that are in an observable collection, you don't necessarily want a listener, like uh, in the left panel, every room in the list, you don't want a listener to the room for every room in the list. That should, like if you have a big account, that would be potentially thousands of listeners. So instead, the room um, will send updates over its parent collection. And that goes all the way down. And then the list the list view that will actually render it will pass that update again to um, to the um, to its child view. Um, so there's for a, a big observable list, there's only one listener for updates, really. Um, and then, uh, yeah, room, for example, does both because we've got a, if you have a room open, you'll have a room view model that exists. And you don't want to go through an observable collection finding your own room in there. So room will emit the same events in the after sync, both through the event emitter for just um, if you're looking at a particular room, but then also through the collection updates uh, to update the left panel. And that way we get the best of both worlds there. Um, then also we have observable values. That's more for individual properties like sync.status that we saw. Um, if you just want to observe that property rather than a whole object. Um, right. 
So yeah, um, as mentioned before, hydrogen um, relies heavily on storage. Um, yeah, that helps it uh, work well offline. Uh, the database is sort of its its source of truth um, rather than the server. And um, it also helps to use as little memory as possible because um, nothing is kept in memory. Uh, well, as little as possible. Um, uh, so messages as they come in, they will get decrypted. Uh, you write whatever we need to storage, but then they're sort of uh, discarded. Uh, and once only once you open the room again, will those messages get loaded from storage. Um, um, we also denormalize a bit. We saw that in room summary for speed. Um, we just basically don't want to, if you start up the app, you want to do as little reads from the database as possible. So what we have is just one get me all the room summaries, and that allows us to, to render the UI uh, immediately. So um, yeah. And then, yeah, like I said, uh, it's nice to be able to store the, sync the one sync response in one transaction. It either happened or it didn't. One downside is if something goes wrong, uh, it can brick more the whole app because none of your rooms will sync and you'll just get sync stopped. Um, um, uh, yeah, and things, things break. Um, so yeah, things shouldn't go wrong. Um, uh, so far, yeah, there, there have been issues like that, but um, yeah, now this, this part seems roughly stable. Um, right, so this, the Hydrogen currently has only a web app and on the web we use IndexedDB, so that is the only storage layer we have. Um, it's a browser API for key value stores. Um, it's quite low level. If you want, like, if you want your where or order by SQL um, clauses, you sort of need to create indexes for that manually. You've got one by default, which is your primary key. If you want other alternative ways of sorting or or, or selecting, you need to add a different. Uh, you need to add an index. You can see here the schema currently for hydrogen, uh, and the by the, the, the key is a, a secondary indexes. Um, yeah. Um, so range queries are very natural in 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 in, uh, in IndexedDB and, and just going with a cursor over a range of values uh, by a sorting order. Um, then, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it supports transactions, which is really nice. But they auto close, so sometimes uh, it's a good storage layer to start with because it, it will affect your architecture. Uh, the fact that IndexedDB auto closes its transactions. Although in general, I guess even if you um, even if it did not a close, you wouldn't necessarily want to keep a storage transaction open while you do a request that might take seconds and blocking any other transaction from going through. Um, so IndexedDB is very much made for storing a lot of small items rather than a few large ones, and that is really key to keeping it fast. Um, and currently, my hydrogen account in the timeline events store you can see in the in the right holds like 300,000 uh, events and it, it just, it doesn't blink. It's it, the amount of items stored, it doesn't affect the speed at all. Um, so yeah, that's a really nice property. And then the schema is also virgin, uh, version, so uh, it's easy to, uh, to do data migrations. So yeah, um, a lot of these stores are uh, related to end-to-end and, and, and encryption operations is sort of an example of this uh, store the intent or not necessarily intent here, but uh, this is for operations that will be asynchronous, but we can't lose. We can't lose track of, like one example here is key sharing. If we decide that we need to share a key with someone when we send an end-to-end -end encrypted message, that intention never get lost, whatever happens to the app, um, because that if that happens, then it means that they won't be able to decrypt your message. So um, operation is a sort of a, a general store for that. We have a type, which here would be key, uh, a key share, and then a scope, which would be a room ID here. Um, but the intent is very much for other uh, things to use that as well. Like you could think uh, uh, cross-signing bootstrapping is one example of an, a process that is involves a lot of steps and you don't want to lose that intent. So that, that, that would definitely fit in there as well. Uh, pending events, where you store events that haven't been sent yet. Um, then two interesting ones here are timeline events and timeline fragments. We'll get into those next. 
Actually, we have flume summaries first, but uh, we, we sort of covered that already. Um, yeah, uh, these are all the fields that we sort of need. There's a few, two last ones is sort of to support end-to-end -end encryption, but it's natural to put them there. But yeah, this is basically all the fields that we need to be able to render the room list. And as the sync comes in, um, we'll incrementally update this. Uh, and then also, yeah, both the stored version and the in-memory version, because that's about the only thing that is kept in memory, the room summaries. Um, yeah. Um, right. So um, this is about how the timeline works. So we've got fragments. And um, so a thing about matrix timelines is that you only know, as a client, you only see a part of it. And um, the sync API is made in a way if there's more than 10 new events to report, uh, it will create a gap. And then you can fill that gap. Um, but one thing from a from a from a client perspective is that we um, we want to have like um, we're st we're storing basically um, the events in, in the, the way we want to show them in sorting order of displaying them um, and to change that order on disk would be very expensive. Um, so you never want to rewrite an event uh, just because. Um, a new event comes in or, or you fill a gap. So basically, this, the timeline is organized in, in fragments, and those fragments can link to each other. And we know for certain that within a fragment, the order of events will never change anymore. Um, so events have a, 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 a number to identify them, and they're basically sorted by this number inside the fragment. And then fragments. Uh, can be loose, they, they can be connected to each other or, or not, and uh, the connection goes both ways. They get connected uh, if there's a gappy sync, because then we know, okay, where the gap is, so we can easily link those up. Or if we detect an overlap, if while syncing an event or backfilling, uh, you say, hey, I know about this event already, then you basically assume there's an overlap. Um, and every fragment also has these tokens to fill the gap in, in either direction. Um, Can you comment on how that's different from the JS SDK? But just because I know that this is already somewhat handled, right? Right. Um, well, the JS SDK, first of all, handles this mainly in memory, but not on disk. The JS SDK will only store X amount of events, um, um, the X last events in a room. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, if a gap occurs in the JS SDK, as far as I know, it will throw away all the events and just um, start over again. And then um, I'm not sure whether it would actually, yeah, if it will refetch the events before, but basically it will reset the timeline. And that is basically, um, I think it will rewire. It also has the con it has a similar concept of, of of fragments. It calls them timelines, and then yeah, um, yeah. It's a bit it's a bit um, it's a bit far in my mind, but um, yeah. No worries. Sorry, it's a bit of an unfair question if you haven't been uh, working on such a technical <laughs> detail. Um, but I thought a comparison might be good. Yeah. Cool. Every time I worked on it in the past, I had to look up again how it works. But um, yeah, that's the nature. Yeah, of the I think the the main. <laughs> The main difference is that here it happens on disk as well, and not just in memory. Gotcha. Um, um, right, and here again, we don't want to. We only if we read the timeline. If you scroll up in hydrogen, it will keep reading. Um, if it finds a fragment boundary, it will start reading from that next fragment. And while reading the timeline again, if we the more read queries we do, the slower it will be to show new events on the timeline. So we store as much information, we store all the information to display an event on the event object itself. So um, that includes the, the profile, um, the avatar of the user that sent it, and the, their display name. This is in the protocol, this is not. Um, this is a separate event if people change their name or their avatar. but uh on the storage we, we started on the event itself so uh, we don't need to do any more queries when we read the timeline same will be true for uh, reactions which i hope to start on soon and and relations in general uh so we don't uh we don't have to uh yeah read another store 
if we want to display how many reactions. Um, and again, there's a trade-off here. For example, if you hover over a reaction, it will it shows you who sent those reactions. And this probably we wouldn't want to store on the event itself because you don't want those events to uh, those up event objects to become too large. So there's a, a trade-off there be between keeping the object small but still storing everything on it to be able to display it uh, in one go. One other thing that this, this sort of uh, approach uh, would permit that would be really cool is for room versioning, if there's a protocol change and you want to apply that to your room, you would um, upgrade the room to a new version and that basically creates a new room. Um, and so far the UX for that has been a, a button where you can click and then it takes you to the new room new room version. And if in that new room, you scroll all the way up, you'll see a link to the old room. But uh, a user is not really interested in this. And for him, it's just the same room. So we could just link up the fragments between different rooms. And then you could just, you would just have a continuous timeline across room versions, which would be really cool. So um, this is a screenshot of my, um, my timeline event store, and you can see here how things are stored in uh, in uh, the sorting order we will display them in. So this is this is how messages got sent in that room. Here you can see the uh, the event index, which is just going up, and then also the fragment ID, which I highlighted here. Um, so yeah, in this case the fragments are, are uh, one after the other, but this doesn't have to be the case because the fragments, as we said, they are. Uh, they're doubly linked list, so um, we're not assuming the order of the fragments, even though they coincide here. And you see the display name uh, also stored on here. Right, that was sort of the matrix layer. Um, can move a bit into the view layer now. So as I said, it uses uh, model view, view model pattern. Um, the key to this basically is that the view models don't know anything about the view, so they're platform independent. And the view only knows about its view model. And when the view model, when there's something changes in the view model, like the name of a room changes, the view model will expose, it has its properties to read the name and uh, also methods. Like if you send a message, the view has to tell the view model that you're sending a message. So there's a method for that. Um, and yeah, the view model can emit events. So the properties need to be checked again uh, to see if they changed. Um, yeah, and the view models are really tailored to the view. So they only have public methods and properties that the view needs and they don't serve any other purpose. Um, they're really tailored to the view. Um, so yeah, uh, the view just becomes another swappable layer like this. Um, and, and that's how I hope to sort of make it least painful possible to write another UI for the same app and all the rest can be used this way. Um, the actual view is written with a custom uh, a custom uh, templating library. Uh, as I mentioned, this started as a spare time project and I had a fun idea how you could write a really simple but still powerful templating uh, library. So I went with that. And again here, um, I didn't want to use transpiling and, and a lot of the frameworks in, in use today allow this. Um, there is the syntax called JSX. Um, which assumes transpiling and that I didn't use. A lot of other frameworks also allow you to not use this, but yeah, this is how I chose the syntax for this. So uh, we've got a, uh, first we've got a component model, which only has four methods, um, mount, unmount, and update and root. So first thing the parent component would call mount or the bootstrapping code. And after mount, root has to return a DOM object, a DOM element. And after unmount, root doesn't have to, like, root is only valid to be called between mount and unmount. And then there's update <coughs> um, to uh, have, um, yeah, the API is a bit less clear there. It's basically for collect for uh, parents to notify their children of updates. And this is heavily used in the list view uh, for the observable collections that can delegate their updates, so they only have yeah one listener. So one, uh, the first component is static view, which is just uh, a bit of uh, syntactic uh, sugar on top of the DOM API. So you've got t.div, can pass an object 
uh, for the attributes and then a string for text nodes or more t dot diffs for other for child nodes. Uh, yeah, this is just does the same thing as a DOM. Then there's list view, and this, as we said before, takes an observable list and it tries to uh, most efficiently render those um, events, the add, update, and uh, remove events in, in the DOM of that list. So an add event will just render the child view and then attach that to the DOM at the right index. Remove will revert that, and then updates will actually delegate that to the child view. Um, we're going to see an example of that as well. Um, but first, we have the template view, which is probably 80% of the views use this. Uh, on top of the static view, it adds one-way uh, data binding support. So yeah, this again is, is quite simple. It's like 350 lines of code. Uh, but it supports six types of bindings, well, five types and, and subviews. Um, you can attach event listeners. Um, you can have attribute bindings, which is just a lambda that maps your view model, uh, which is passed to the template uh, view, to a property of, of, that, uh, of that view model. And then the bindings, every time an update comes in, are re-evaluated. And if the return value of the lambda is different than the previous time, the DOM gets updated. So basically, the DOM, the, the bindings are as fast as your properties on your view models are. Um, uh, if yeah, if it's just reading a value, the 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 the, the, the checking uh, is is quite fast. Then uh, class name bindings, which is quite convenient, that you can just have a an object with functions. And every time a binding updates, it will update the class name, sort of a bit of sugar. Um, then text text bindings. If yeah, a child is, is it just a function, it's assumed that it will be a text node. So you can just, uh, yeah, uh, render properties uh, like this. Then all of the bindings we've seen so far, they assume that the structure of your DOM won't change, just that the contents of certain nodes, nodes will Will change but of course it does happen that the structure of your dom changes so in that case uh, there's t.map and it maps a binding to uh, a new sub template in this case and it will replace the previous uh, the previous sort of um, node that was created by the template by a new one um, so here you map the view model to option shown and then you get that the map property in the second render function together with this newly created sub template. And here you can then return a different structure once that property has uh, uh, changed. And there's a few specialization of that. This assumes that you want a template. You can also do that for views. You also have if and if view for uh, if you just want to core something to a Boolean and, and, and yeah. Um, so yeah, that's node bindings basically for changing the structure of your DOM. And then t.view just attaches a sub view, um, which may or may not be a template view or, or something else. And this basically is enough uh, to write most views in a declarative style, which, which sort of is the goal. Um, and um, yeah, it, as I said, it started as an idea I had, but I'm, I'm actually quite happy with it for now. Um, if at some point I want to not maintain my own view library, um, the view the view is thin enough to uh, to replace it. But um, so far, yeah, I haven't really come across any. Yeah, the the t dot map was something where I wanted to ch to change the structure of the the DOM, so I introduced that. But um, yeah, it's very little code. I find it very pleasant to debug. Um, it's very simple, and it's it's nice to work straight with the DOM. Some things like Imperatively manipulating the DOM is a lot more pleasant this way. Um, Bruno, just um, uh, um, jumping in very quickly. Um, yeah. uh, have you looked at Preact as a um, um, API shape for templating? Preact is basically a, a lightweight replacement for React, no? Yeah, that's like 3K of React, but I'm not talking about the um, sort of uh, reconciliation diffing stuff, but literally, it, because it doesn't have JSX, it has something that looks 
pretty similar to this, at least in terms of the kind of T dot dev syntax. I was just wondering oh, yeah. if it well, was coincidental or by design. I haven't actually no, it's coincidental, but uh yeah, I think if you wanna if you want to make a declarative style in JavaScript, this is as close you, as you can get. So I don't think cool. Yeah. Uh it's a natural place to land. Um Right, but yeah, mentioning React, one important thing here is that the render function is only called once. And after that, uh, your render function will never be called again. Uh, it's only your bindings that will be called after that. So if you come from a React world, that might be something to get used to. Um, right, so this is an example of how views can be composed with this. Um, uh, we have a diff here, then yeah, we created some DOM elements here in utilities row before. Then we mounted a sub view, which is not a template view in this case, it's a list view, um, which is specialized in rendering these observable collections, which would be harder to do with a template view. Um, and we pass a lambda to the list view to create the child views. So for every rent for every item in the observable collection, it will create a room tile view, and it's handed over the item in the collection, which we saw before was going to be a room tile view model, and just passes as in. This code is a bit simplified, but that's that's the basic idea of it. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, compose compose things like this. Um, right. So that was hydrogen. Um, recently, we've been thinking as well a bit how all of this work, apart from uh, yeah, creating a new client could also benefit um, Element Web. Um, and uh, if this would happen, it would be sort of hydrogen spawning in SDK and that being used um, potentially instead of Matrix.js SDK. That's, that's sort of the level where they could share code. The problem is that Element Web is, is quite tightly coupled to the, the Matrix SDK, even up to in the views. Um, and there's, yeah. There's a lot of code in those views. So one idea is, um, that we're discussing currently is to move element over to the same MVVM pattern and to make those views as small as possible and have all that logic um, that uh, knows about the JSSDK, split that into view models in a domain layer. This would all yeah, not be based on hydrogen yet, but still on, on the JSDK. And in parallel to that, we evolve hydrogen uh, where it's it's more feature complete. And and moving element over to MVVM would in no means by no means be a, a small task. This would yeah this would be uh, uh, quite involved. But while th those uh, things are going on, once they're sort of both in a state where we're happy with, we could consider starting alternative view models based on the hydrogen SDK. Uh, next to uh, the one that is based on the JS SDK. And while we bring part of the app over like this by basically uh, providing an alternative view model implementation, we might have uh, a state where, yeah, you only want to have one account synced. You don't want every account syncing or, or so we could pipe requests from one SDK into another, at least for testing. Um, potentially for shipping, but yeah, it might be hard to get it completely right, but at least for verifying that the thing we're doing would be correct. So yeah, that's, this is an idea we're working on. Um, um, whichever way we turn it, I think it's, it's going to be complicated, but it may be, may be worth the effort nonetheless. Right. That's that's all I have. That was a lot. I hope uh, <laughs> I didn't lose too many people on the it way. It was um, super, dude. Well done, Bruno. Um, yeah, it's it's a difficult topic to present because you know you need to convey. Uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Extra long doorbell. Um, <laughs> so, Bruno, well, well done. Um, yeah, con conveying all that was super. Um, just chatting in private there it reminds me so much of uh, of Silverlights and the. Um, Microsoft actually called their implementation observable collection. Um, yes, I've actually worked uh, you know, with the su successor of Silverlight and I got a lot of the, uh, some of the inspiration there as well. Interesting. Yeah, it was giving me flash flashbacks. Not not all bad. Um, so we did get some good technical questions, though. Um, oh, let's talk, start with this one. Um, will hydrogen be used to experiment with new features in the future in the same way that Dendrite is on the home server side? So room upgrades is one of the suggestions where you could have a, you know, a single room view of a upgraded history. Um, yes, that's definitely um, 
definitely an idea. So far, it hasn't happened yet because um, uh, mainly because there was customer work that yeah just made sense to uh, to take first. But um, it's definitely an idea we want to do. I think Matthew has some ideas on that as well. Yeah, very much so. I thought that um, isn't Quentin doing his single sign-on experiments with hydrogen and dendrite? Um, he might be doing it unbeknownst to you. But there's there is whole... an open draft PR from somebody called Sandhose. I think that's the person yep. you're referring yeah, to. That's, yeah, uh, that's fine. Um, yeah. The, uh, I didn't read the MSC, so I didn't. I, I would have to read the MSC to probably make sense of the PR. But so I people are trying to bit... do it. You might be ignoring their PRs, but people are frantically <laughs> trying to extend matrix using hydrogen. And yeah, I've got a secret mission on the horizon, hopefully, to improve the sync API that I was working on over the weekend. I almost have an MSC for it, and I've already pinged Neil Alexander, warning him that we might want to experiment with dendrite on it and the corollary might be pinging you to say, please, Bruno, can mm. we um, experiment with hydrogen because it will make hydrogen go approximately 50 times faster, I think. Great. Look forward to that. Uh, so, all right, softer question. Uh, are you, um, it's just you, sort of, there are PRs, um, but are you um, feeling short-staffed? Are you, are, you, are you able to make progress when it's just, you're, you're only one man? Right. Yes. Um, yeah. It's, I think. Yeah. It's just me, um, which is already a lot. I'm very happy to work on this full time uh, during the office hours. Um, um, yeah, you get to work on your side project. Exactly. I mean, I'm not sure if that's a pleasure or a curse, but yeah, uh, it's maybe it's mostly a pleasure. Um, um, but. Um, yeah, it's often disappointing to tell, well, this feature, when people ask, how can I do this? Basic things you expect from a chat client, things that are not supported yet. Um, yeah, um, sometimes, yeah, it, um, you don't want to say no to people, but yeah, that's just the way it is. Like, you have to add one feature at a time. Um, yeah, it's also, for example, the, the documentation on hydrogen could be a lot better. and. Now uh, we've got uh, GSOC internships and, and generally more community PRs uh, coming in. And uh, this is definitely becoming a pain that um, I hope this talk will serve as a documentation as well, by the way. But um, yeah, for people, this is the, you just have to read the code basically currently to 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 make sense all of this. So uh, that's definitely a pain for contributors apart from me. Yeah, I think um, this, this talk will definitely help there. Mm -hmm. Um, so one, a couple more questions. What is the, what's the, all right, this is direct, but what's the benefit of moving elements of the hydrogen SDK? Will you eventually depre deprecate the JS SDK? Well, is that a product question when, I, when you're the tech guy? No, I mean, we don't know yet. Um, okay, we know that element web, um, could be faster, um, that a feedback we often get uh is that it feels slow um and uh yeah i think uh we all wish it wasn't it weren't that way but um um yeah changing that is is, is quite tricky like um there's assumptions in jssdk um that make that hard to change and um it's an idea we're playing with i would say um we want to solve these performance issue one way or another this might be mm -hmm. a good way um we're playing with the idea of sort of also reducing the number of, of SDKs we produce um, to have less um, cross-client issues and just have less yeah, SDKs that we need to uh, support. So um, one idea is to sort of have hydrogen SDK uh, become sort of the web SDK that we, we provide. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Rust SDK sort of becoming a native uh, SDK. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's hard to yeah it's hard to say more than that. It's we'll have to see how it plays out. No worries. Um, there's one last technical point then, which is uh, talking about progressive web apps. iOS is known to be aggressive with their browser um, and sort of against PWAs. Has this caused any issues? So yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Like uh, recently, push notifications got added, which work quite well on Android. Um, this doesn't work on iOS at all. And if you want something from an, a chat app, it is notifications. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you can only do so much on iOS. I think 
it can still provide value like that because um, uh, yeah, it can be nice to have something that you, an app that you don't need to install or um, another use case for hydrogen that we want to support is easily embedding uh, a chat into a chat room into a web page and knowing that it will work on, on Safari on iOS uh, will definitely be useful there. Um, yeah. But as I mentioned, I also have this 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 idea or, or dream, if you will, to um, to support multiple platforms. And on iOS, you could imagine a bit something like React Native does, uh, or potentially using React Native, or just having Hydrogen SDK run in its own uh, JavaScript core context and have that communicate with a native API, with a native UI, and that way you could support all the native features you want while still using two thirds of the Hydrogen code. See. Bruno, thank you for taking the time to explain hydrogen. I think people are all quite looking forward to it. Um, and yeah, I, what we will now do the next time somebody just says, how do the guts of hydrogen work? We'll say, hey. Exactly. Um, and those people will get to see the other the other videos too. So let's say thank you to the, uh, the Safe Support Chat crew, which is Kim Allen, Sharon Kennedy, and Brent Edwards. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work and thank you for your kind words about the project. Um, thank you as well to Will Bamberg, your phenomenal work you're doing on uh, Open Web Docs. So thank you for continuing, uh, continuing that. And thank you for Bruno. Thanks all. Pleasure. Bye. Bye Thanks, now. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.